Good evening, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. And with it, another Jules in the Blood chats too. And I'm pleased to say that this evening, fresh from a traffic jam, I'm and now I'm joined by none other than Jules, Director of Football, EFL Managerial Legend, Kenny Jacket. Uh, Kenny, first of all, before we get into this chat, I appreciate you coming on. I understand you're a very busy man, especially at this time of pre-season. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming on and um, looking forward to this one. Yeah, pleasure, Matt. Yeah, good to talk to you as well. Excellent. Thank you. Right, let's get straight into it then. Um, obviously, want to talk about Jill's, but you've only been at Jill's for six months. And there's not loads and loads that we can go into in terms of time span. So I want to go right back to the beginning of your career first, Kenny, if you, if you don't mind. Um, I think it's fair to say that you probably were one of certainly the types of players that we don't see anymore. And that was you as a one club man. You spent yeah. the entirety of your playing career at, at Watford. Unfortunately, so you, your career came to a, a premature end and we, we'll talk about that in more detail. But number one, why do you think we don't see them types of players anymore that spend their entire career at one club? And number two, I've got to ask just, just what it was like to play under the tutelage of, of someone who was as, as big a legend in the English game as Graham Taylor. Yeah, it, it is. It is different now in terms of players move on. Um, I think, I, 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 you know, in terms of loyalty, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's as much loyalty, definitely. Uh, but also, um, you know, people's tolerance maybe of players might not be there as well from the from the from the terraces. So I think it's, it works both ways. Um, crowds generally want to see new players quite often now, and 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 as I said, you know, the the um, uh, the one club man isn't is, isn't quite there now, so I I think it's a combination of loyalty from the players' side, but but also, you know, wanting to see something new and driving things. On. Yeah, I think the games come become yeah. probably certainly from more the, short term uh, from the crowd side as well. Sorry, your, your audio just broke Time. up a little there, Kenny. But yeah, I think I think is it probably fair to say that the games just become a little short termist now? The modern game, I mean. I can only think of Dean Lewington at MK Dons who's still playing. And before that, probably Ryan Giggs in the English game is the only two. But and I guess social media probably has a part to play in that as well, do you think? Yeah, it's a bigger picture of all of it, definitely. Um, there's, you know, there's a combination of things, um, uh, you know, but, but you know, players being loyal to the club as well doesn't necessarily happen. You know, they want to move on and maximise their career, maybe. Of you course, know, that, it that's, is a that's short career, and we have to remember that, isn't it? It's a very short career, a playing career. And and you know whether that's right or wrong, it's just you know it's the answer to to, to, to your question of where it is. You know, players want to maximise their their career. You know, before their mid thirties, uh, sometimes though it doesn't work out for the better. You know, oh, you, you try things, and you know, you see a lot of players move on because you know it's the thing to do, or they go go on a fresh challenge. But quite often as well, though, the grass isn't greener. That happens a lot as well. It really does, you know. So it, there, there, there's there's situations where loyalty will be better rewarded and and um, uh, be beneficial for people's careers as well. Absolutely, yeah. And I suppose another thing is is there's more sponsorship deals, isn't there, and that type of thing now, bigger boot deals. People are doing, you know, magazine shoots, whereas if you go back to sort of the 80s and the 90s, when I grew up, it was, you got your contract and, and that was pretty much it. If you got a boot deal on top of that, you was doing well. Yeah, very much so. Don't get me wrong, League One and League Two are still, you know, uh, uh, pretty pretty basic, pretty limited, if you like, in terms of you know the actual contracts. The complexities of the contracts do change as you go higher up. But but you know, in in terms of maybe you know sides trying to get the best out of their players commercially, that 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 has stepped on. And and there's some clubs that are very talented at doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And and while you know you're, you're coming from the angle of the player, maybe exploiting his own potential uh, uh, or earning capacity. Um, you know, clubs clubs are pretty good at it now as well, and and have to be really to to maximise you know the, 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 their their own coverage. Oh, of course, yeah, because it's 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 clear now, isn't it, in the modern game that football clubs have to just be more than a football club. You've got to have multiple revenue streams. But I want to talk about Graham Taylor, who's obviously yeah. former England manager, iconic Aston Villa manager, iconic Watford manager before that as well. Was the manager under the, the great Sir Elton John? What was what was that time of your career like? I know it didn't end as you'd probably wished as a player, but it must have been brilliant to be playing in the 80s under under someone of, you know, that ilk. Yeah, I, I played for him for 10 years. 
and mm -hmm. and come through you know come through the youth ranks at Watford under them so under those circumstances and then later on I was assistant manager to him for five years so but in that in those two side, uh, pieces saw two different sides to him mm -hmm. uh, um, you know taught me a lot about management in that in that five years which which really did help me you know watching him go through the England experience if you like you know and then yeah. come out the other side and get promotions after that you know was was, was interesting and fascinating as well but you know certainly the the early years of, of of the um of my playing career anyway it was a fantastic time you know Watford were were on the up they were going through the divisions they had enough finance because of the chairman the profile was was really high and the manager was very talented and you know we had some some excellent players it was a very very good team so it just seemed like it was almost an unstoppable force at that time. You know, if they couldn't work it out one season on the pitch, they were going to work walk it work it out the the other. And 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 also as well, you know, we we signed John Barnes as well, who was yeah, just about, which did help. He uh, did which, all right, didn't he? After right, that, right, yeah, you know, if you, he turned if, out if all right. If you're looking at managerial careers, and sometimes the right signings can make you. I mean, he was a fantastic player of his generation. He was the best. You know, talking about Watford, but you know, we had the best player in the country. You know. Yeah. in our ranks as well so so that helped but but no Graham was a really intelligent man um um effervescent and and you know very very bubbly particularly in those earlier years and and then saw a different person generally when you know when I when I went as assistant manager and as I said you know the the, the wider range of the game contracts etc you know looking at it from from a manager's perspective a very experienced manager as well by then certainly helped me and projected me you know onto to my managerial, my managerial career. Of course, yeah. And, you, and it's fair to say that you did all right as well. And we'll come to that in a short while. But because uh, the, the big thing I think with Graham Taylor is everyone remembers that video from that documentary during the 94 World Cup qualifying. And like you mentioned, he was a very good manager again after that. So it was testament to his character, I guess, that he was able to come back from such a thing like that. Because that was sort of something very new back then, wasn't it? I mean, we see football documentaries all the time now. They're 10 a penny. But back then it was very sort of, probably ahead of its time, so to speak, that documentary of him when he was England manager. So to come back from that and then still have success was 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 testament to his character, I guess. Yeah, and in my opinion, it didn't it didn't do obviously do him justice. Um it didn't do him any good. You know, it mm. shows the the pressure you're under on the sidelines sometimes and the things that you say, you know, aren't necessarily, you know, considered. Uh but um it didn't give a, a, a great reflection of him. It wasn't really, you know, him as a person, as he worked, as he operated, um even even as a guy, you know, he had a Really good sense of humour, um, you know. Re really nice fellow, fa family man, but terrific sense of humour as well to to work with. So wasn't wasn't necessarily you know the best projection, but in a very long career, it's hard to be successful in all of it. And and as you say, e e either side of it, and if certain you know key moments had gone his way, maybe it would have been different. But mm -hmm. you know, he certainly stood the test of time in club football as well, and you know achieved great things. And I think it's probably fair to say that he didn't have the greatest pool of England players to pick with at the time. If you look back over the last 30, 40 years, it wasn't a, a, a you know, a, a brilliant generation to be choosing from. There was the odd one or two, but there was, for me, as a fan, obviously you know more about it being in the game, it, it looked like a bang average set of players that were available for selection around the, the early 90s after the Italian 90. Yeah, and, and a, lot, a lot of the, the, the international matches are close. You know, they're very close and they can get turned on a, you know, on a decision or two, or, or or maybe you know one bit of brilliance. I I, I felt at the time they were very reliant on on, on Paul Gascoigne. Mm -hmm. You know, it really was him. If if he was in in top form, I think he could carry the whole team. You know, and and you know he did at times, and other times he didn't. Got the injury as well, which which, which stopped him. You know, you do you look at all the, the great world world class teams and 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 the, the the sides in international football. If they have got that one iconic player that that inspires the rest and and gives you that little bit of magic that can turn the game. You know, he certainly was that one at that time and he produced at times and didn't at others. And also, like you say about decisions, Rotterdam, Ronald Koeman should have been sent off. We should have had a, maybe a penalty or a free kick. I think it was trying to remember back sort of 30, 40 years. But yeah, there's always fine lines, isn't there? And unfortunately, yeah, there England, is fine it seemed lines. that Graham came out on the wrong side of them. Yeah, but there is fine lines. But, you know, Graham Taylor, the, you know, the football manager, but Graham Taylor, the person anyway, was... You know, it was 10 out of 10 as a person, integrity, uh, honesty, you know, family man, uh, 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 cared for people, cared for people at the club, everybody at the club. He had time for and would help, you know, would help anybody. So, you know, th th those things sort of left a, a big impression on me as well in terms of, you know, how he treated people and the person that he was. 
Excellent. We've already touched on it, and obviously, I don't think you, you you want to dwell on it too much. But your career did get cut short because of a knee injury, I think, and you had to stop playing at 28, which was must have been a massive disappointment when you was playing under such a great man, anyway. But how did you deal with that? And and was it almost that that, that fast tracked you into the game of management, or was it something that you'd already set out from a young age? You thought. I suppose even just organically being around people like Graham Taylor meant that you was soaking up and taking in so much information that you couldn't help but learn. Yeah, I played a lot of games early. I was playing at 18 and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I racked up the games, racked up the yeah, 31 caps of Wales pretty quickly. And, and, and that was good. And then, as you said, then uh, got the injury. But separate from that and aside from that, I had all my coaching, I, I had my full coaching qualifications that you could get at that time by the time I was 24. Um, I, you know, I, start, I started at 19 and then, and, and I wanted to do that, but but also play as long as I could anyway. You know, I was always interested in coaching. Uh, my, my dad was a, a former professional footballer. There weren't many other conversations in in our house to be honest with you growing up. So, you know, that's the way it was. So, yeah, I had a strong interest in coaching. Didn't know, obviously, you know, my career was going to be cut short, but, mm. you know, certainly when, when I came out of playing, it, it, it was early, but it was always something that I wanted to do. And as I said, you know, I had a, as, as, you know, I was fully qualified as a coach for, for what you could do then. And, and um, l luckily got the break at Watford and, and, and started as a under 18 coach at, at 28 years old. I guess, like you say, it probably softened the blow to a degree, knowing that you'd got all the qualifications already, rather than it was, oh, I'm injured, I've now got to go and do it all. And so it was almost, a, a not natural, but there was it was an easier transition. Yeah, it was always something I was going to go into. And also as well, you know, I spent probably two years, I mean, maybe from 26 to 28, you know, I was injured. So I didn't just wake up one morning and, and see it was going to, you know, I, I could see it coming for, 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 for a, a little while, while yeah. really, to be honest with you. And you can see where... You know, you, you can, can you get back? I've tried a few times. I played a few league games in that time and, and and then went back out of it because of my knee. So, you know, by the time it actually happened, I've got to be honest with you, it's a little bit of a relief, you know. It had been been on the cards for a, certainly a year, you know. Yeah, and, I suppose and, it must be a you know, like and then, the weight and then off your people say, oh, you're say, disappointed. Yeah. I can remember relief being the ultimate one at the time because, you know, it looked like it had been on the cards for, 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 for several months, really, and... and once you actually might make the decision and decide to step on with your life, it's you know sometimes easier. Blessing in disguise, and it didn't work out too bad in terms of being a manager and a coach. There is obviously another individual that that we're going to have to talk about. Um, you signed him, I think, back in two thousand and seven originally when you was Millwall manager. You can probably tell where this is going, Kenny. Um, <laughs> I think he repaid you by scoring around forty times over the next four years, despite being in his thirties. He's our manager now, Neil Harris. Is all I'm talking about. I'm sure you got that, and I'm sure the viewers worked that out as well. But but what's so special about Neil? What was so special about Neil at, at what was probably approaching a veteran stage of his career to still be so productive and produce them numbers for you? Um, and, and again, just give us some insight into to what he's like as a, as a manager and, and more importantly, an individual. Yeah, is he was a key player. Um, I went into Millwall. They were in the relegation places in in League One. Mm -hmm. to sort of go down to League Two, if you like. And and um, at, at the time, the, 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 the team really struggled playing at home. Um, you know, it wasn't a good side. Um, it crumbled a little bit in front of the crowd. Obviously, the season wasn't going well because, of, you know, tailed out by, the obviously, the, the place we were in the league. Anyway, one of the players that actually could handle playing at the Den was Neil. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was the record goal scorer. He, he 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 was in a good place with a crowd, but he also responded and led. So, you know, getting him him on that pitch in those early days was was a really key one because we really had that the first year I was there, I went in halfway through and first year I was there, we were really we really battled to stay up. And and so, you know, he, he, he was a he was a key person, a key leader. He, he went on then as we improved the side, we got promoted. We got got the playoffs the next year. We got promoted mm -hmm. the year after. And in that time, as we as we improved the team, and and got got stronger, he grew with it. You know, and and um, play, he played a massive part in it anyway, on and off the field, in in getting us into the the the, the, the championship. You know, that 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 was a big thing. Uh, uh, for me coming here now, he's somebody I had a you know good relationship with of. I was kept in touch with, 
um, spoke several times on his managerial journey and mine, definitely. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it wasn't somebody I needed to get to know. And, you know, I, I could read him pretty well. And and then watching the early games, really, I could, you know, I could if it would be somebody that maybe I hadn't known so well or needed to get going with a relationship or or, or, or learn a little bit more about him. But, you know, I felt I knew Neil and, and did know him very well when I came into Gillingham. And, you know, our results needed to turn around quickly. And, and our relationship, yeah. I do feel really helped that you know I could I could read it I could read him and um you know results fell, followed quickly so yeah a, a good relationship and and um long may it continue and I suppose that works both ways as well done it Neil knew that you were coming in and he knew he could trust you straight away because again the same thing he didn't have to build up a relationship or any type of rapport with you either personally or working so it worked both ways didn't it and I know he knows Hesse as well so it all sort of probably fell into place quite naturally yeah, and, and say say for me, I, I would want to be able to, you know, almost read the manager and know his next moves, if you like, for me to be as effective in my job as I can, because then, you know, I can give him the right feedback, give him a different angle from up in the stand, which is sure. important. You know, you're down on the bench sometimes and, you know, you see one thing and you need to be there. You need to be close to your players, but you also do need a good a good opinion, I think, up in the stand where you are detached from it. You haven't necessarily seen the build up with the players, and and you can you, you can come from a different angle. So, you know, it's the, 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 you know, get, getting that information to him and to the to the staff is is is, is vital and you know very very important as well because you do need to, to to come at it from a different a different side and a different angle. And as you say, you know, an existing relationship helped in that situation definitely. Absolutely. You're talking like a manager there, Kenny. I can tell. Um which is obviously it's been your life. So totally understand that. And you've had success doing it as well. Promotions, I think, with Swansea, Millwall, Wolves. Um, Football League trophy twice, I think, as well. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what yeah. was it? Was it just that you was at a stage in your career that you didn't want to do the day-to-day -day of the coaching, the touchline, that type of thing? Because you've just spoken about being detached, being up in the stands, giving a different opinion. Um, so what led you to the decision to to come into Jules back in, in January? Because it was only a couple of weeks after the Gallinsons had, had obviously taken over the club and it was it was a club on the floor. You've already alluded to that. We were desperately short of confidence, goals, points, quality players. Um, okay. What was the deciding factor that, that made you come to Jules and, and go from being a football manager to being a director of football? First off, I think it's an area that I can do very well in. Mm -hmm. and, and probably suits my skill set now okay. I think I can have a big influence on I can uh, you know obviously the, you know the, the first team first team manager the squad planning um, uh, the recruitment department how and and where we look and and making sure that's efficiently done also an area that's maybe struggled is his players through from the youth team as well you know there's been too many times this season where we've had no homegrown players and and you know we need to build that up as well and I do think that's an area where you know, slightly maybe more long term I can I can help as well and you know we're making good strides in that so it, it, improving every area of a club I do think it's, it's it's something that you know does does suit me now it, uh, um I've got the call to to come over and and and, and speak to the board uh, uh um uh Brad Shannon Paul Scally at that time late December stroke early January I had, mm -hmm. had a couple of meetings sort of talk through you know you know let's say you know my, my own journey if you like what what I think I can add and, and and then most importantly you know what we needed to do if I came on board to to try to stay up because you know it, it was a horrible situation we were in and 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 obviously nobody wanted to go down for various reasons you know new ownership etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. I did feel though that there was enough games to go you know we had still had 23 games to go mm -hmm. That's you know sixty nine points to play for, so there, there was a, there was enough time to to get ourselves out of the the, um, the 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 trouble that we were in, and and I was confident of doing that. So you know, yeah, I was excited by the project, both short term and and now ultimately long term. To mm -hmm. you know try to get us competing at the other end of the table would be great, and and that's our nice. that's our aim this summer in terms of our squad planning. Excellent, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to that, but yeah, I assume so. Obviously, you came in the room; it was just. Get enough quality in to make sure that we stay above, well, above twenty third, isn't it, in this division? And I suppose Kenny, that helped us as well. The fact that there's only two that go down out of League Two, as as much as it's a, I think it's a, 
long mid to longer term, it's a more precarious drop out of the league because we know how hard it is to get back into the football league and in terms of finances and everything like that. But I suppose the only saving grace was that there are only only two clubs that that drop. But still, we had we were what six points adrift, I think, when you and Hesse came on board. We had fourteen points. So what was the immediate remit just to get enough players in to to get above twenty third? I assume. Yeah, I, I felt that there was enough time. You're right. At that particular period, we were six points off, and we'd scored seven goals in twenty three games, something like that. You know, so it, it, it although there was enough time, we knew we had to hit the ground running and get going, yeah. get going quickly, and and then you know being able to persuade people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Got you know things came off in terms of a few lads that are reasonably local and wanted to come to the area. Obviously, Tom Nichols, the first one. You know, Ollie Hawkins uh, yeah. uh, lapsed a little bit later on, a week or two later. You know, there's a few come on in terms of those guys. I thought Masterson coming in was a really good one. I mean, obviously, he'd been, been there the season before, but I'd seen him earlier in the season in Queen's Park Rangers 21s, and I thought he was a really good player then, you know. So I'd, re- I'd seen him recently and was, was happy to, you know, push the button to try to bring him back. He's, he's, he's had a good partnership with... With Max Aimer, you know, yeah, and, uh, yeah. um, so you know, I, fe- I felt that there was there was some, and and then off the back of those, other ones followed. You know, if you know, you see a few going in, and you're thinking, oh, there's a few players there going in, and and it, and it it snowballed pretty quickly for us, which which was which was good, as you said, needed assessing the team anyway. So many of the it was such a, a, a poor position, but so many of the games have been close. I think I'd seen probably three of the games. Um, the last one just before I came in was Sutton away. Uh, Craig Eastman scored in the 93rd minute and it was a, yeah. you know, there was nothing between the teams. And, no. and you can't say, you know, Gillingham were necessarily outplayed, if you like, or but but they lost the game and that was it. Now, there were so many games like that. Defensively, you were pretty solid in the first half of the season, funnily enough, whether that be a, a back three or a, a back four, you know, the, the, the tactics varied. Mm-hmm. And and the lineups vary def- definitely, but generally the goals against Colin wasn't too bad. There wasn't no, a lot, of, you know. There wasn't a lot of chances, masses of chances being created, and yet you know, obviously the bottom line is they were losing games. So we did feel that in terms of if if we could make a big effect going forward, that isn't just the forwards. You know, it was wide areas, attacking midfield, um, physical presence in midfield, athleticism. So you know, the likes of Dieng. Mm-hmm. Lapsley made a, made big areas in that in that in those areas. Uh, uh, the front two uh, of, of Hawkins and, and, and Nichols did a very, you know have done a very good job in terms of giving the side a threat, a platform to play off. Brought you know players like Jeffries, McDonald, brought mm-hmm. them into the game a little bit. You know uh, um, Mackenzie when he's played full back, Shay Alexander in, in 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 the latter games as well. You know got forward, crossed the ball very well, scored one or two. Very big and memorable goals for us as well. So that was, as was as, probably as the most threat, improved player. Was, sorry. Yeah, as much as their threat, they gave us, um, you know, good team ethic, a good platform to to play from. Some confidence from the side that you know maybe you, you do get some forward passes. There's going to be uh, you know a chance of something something happening with it. So you know it was it was, it was pretty obvious from watching the games and and from just just looking at the stats where you needed to improve. And, and what while. while it's hard to look for the positives, you know. That uh, if you're looking at the table, it's hard to find the positives. But as I said, I'd seen three of the games, and you know, I'd, I'd said to, to to Neil, the staff, and all the players when they came in, the actual gap that you've got to make up game by game isn't isn't much. No, you know, if you look like at when you break it down, yeah, Premier League, if you like, you know, you you might you may play Man City or someone like that, and, and obviously you you've got a big gap. That that gap isn't there in League Two. You know, the bottom side can can play the top and if you can find maybe 15 percent you know which you, is what you, we ended uh, up proving over the rest and, of the season and, and then we? and then it snowballs off that because yes. obviously you know results breed confidence and and confidence confidence in players in league one and league two is absolutely massive you know you can yes. you can you can you can see it at, even within a game sometimes you can see it growing and you can see it drain out of them at times you know so you know building up confidence building up momentum is is a really big thing yeah, totally agree. And just back to your point about Shay Alexander, I thought he was probably, and again, but there was plenty, like you said, that once the new players came in who weren't scarred from the first half of the season, suddenly everyone else went, oh, actually, I'm not a bad footballer. I just I just think Shay was probably the most improved player from the first half to the second half of the season. He just completely transformed in terms of being, for me, first half, 
of the season. He looked like someone that was playing safe all the time, wanted to make sure the game was in front of him, didn't want to leave the back door open. But then second half of the season, he turned into this marauding attacking fullback. And like you say, he scored a couple of good goals. He was putting in dangerous deliveries. And yeah, I, 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 was, I was really pleasantly surprised and, and obviously really happy that it was announced that he's, he's got another year because I thought... He was and also, if you're looking going forward, which is which is the main, you know, the main thing, you know, you look forward and you're trying to say, well, come on then, you know, whoever's playing right back, whether it's Shea or Robbie, can, can you develop that side of your game to go mm-hmm. forward? Because, you know, both of them can cross the ball. Both, mm-hmm. both of them can assist. And and can you do it more? <laughs> That's what you have to do now. You know we have we have to we have to hit the ground running. We have to score goals. We have to be a force going forward. And you know both of those coming out of their shell, taking mm-hmm. the responsibility. They both got the delivery. I think you know they both got the final ball. They both got the delivery. You know crosses from both sides from fullback areas is, is is you know a massive source of goals and putting pressure on opposition. And uh, you know both of those can contribute. And and. While they showed signs last year, they're both capable of stepping up and and, and finding another ten or fifteen percent within their game next season. Look forward to seeing it. <laughs> you just touched on the summer. That's where we are now. Um, there's been a couple of signings, and we'll have a quick chat about them before we start wrapping this up. But what are the aims for the summer window and beyond? Obviously, the season. You've already said. We want to be competing at the top end. You've not come out and said anything daft like we're going to win the league. It's a very competitive division and I understand that. The two coming up from the National League are going to be strong. There's a couple of really good sides coming down that perhaps shouldn't have come down, um, but have for one reason or another. And you've still got the existing teams that were up there challenging in this season that's just finished. Your, your Salford, your Bradford's, your Stockports and that type of thing. So... Is there any aim at the moment for, for, for next? I don't want you to put a label on it. And obviously this is going to go out and we put pressure on everyone. But Or is it just a case of let's just keep improving, taking it game by game and see where it takes us for, for 23-24? No, I don't think there's any anything wrong with saying that, you know, we want to go up. OK. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. But okay. we're humble enough to know that it's hard work and good decisions and commitment and, and improving and not standing still. You know, mm-hmm. we have to be aware of that. But, but of course we want to go up. Every 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 side does. We, we definitely do. You know, we, we're we're hundred percent. You know, w- want to get promoted. Every every one of us inside the club. And, and as I said, you know, put some humility on that. Put some, mm-hmm. some some reality to be able to earn it. But you know, we're, we're looking forward to it. Though it's you know internally it's exciting. And, and in terms of this summer, um, we have if you're looking at now with with Johnny signing, you know, we have we have we have eighteen senior players. We have seven junior pros at the moment. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, our, our group of senior players will maybe get to somewhere between 21 and 24. Um, depending on, you know, I was having you get injuries or whatever, and you've got some young lads that can start the season fantastic and come out come out of the, the you know, the youth ranks and, and, and let's say a Joe Gabode or whatever, you know, those those type of lads can come through. But so so it leaves the senior group anyway, you know, somewhere between twenty one and twenty four numbers wise. That that's what that's that's where it will be. And and you know we're around about the seventeen eighteen mark now, depending on where you put one or two of the younger boys. So so you know it's it's a it's a, I think it's a healthy squad as as we stand now. I don't mm-hmm. see. I, I, you know, I don't see see many players around who couldn't contribute. The only one who hasn't played is is Lewis Walker. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he you know missed uh, missed most of the season, missed the second half of the season through injury. Anyway, yeah. didn't get back. He's fully fit now and will start again. Excellent. You know, which is it'll be good to see him fit. It'll be good to see him in the in the first couple of weeks of pre pre season anyway. And 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 so you know, it's it's uh, I, I think quite an efficient squad, but. You know, we're not kidding ourselves. We do know we need to improve it as well. Absolutely. Again, and like it says, it comes back to what you said, and that's we don't want to stand still. We we don't want to just rely on what we've got. We want to keep pushing on and pushing forward, don't we? And yeah, and let's hope that Lewis is another one that improves because he's the only one, like you say, that's missed the chance to try and play with the better players that we got in him from January. Um, final question, Kenny, before I let you go, and again, I appreciate your time, is obviously we've seen two permanent arrivals over the last four or five weeks since the season. Any Connor Masterson was done a few days after the, the end of the season. Um, one that I think every single Gilles fan wanted. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that. Very pleased with that one. Um, and obviously in the last day, Johnny Williams decided that um, he didn't want to go and play up north. He'd rather come back home. Um, what will Connor 
and Johnny offer us in terms of not just playing ability, but in terms of characteristics and their ability as men within the changing room moving forward? Yeah, I've got high hopes we all have for Connor. You know, we can all see the the, the potential in him. We're, we're pleased that he's come here permanent. You know, he's been here. He's obviously been here on loan, um, and, and you know, at centre half, I think his, you know, his best years now are ahead of him. I'm looking for him to be, you know, one of the best centre halves in the league. I think he already is, but mm -hmm. you know, he needs to keep stepping forward and moving forward. And you know, we've got quite an exciting group of, of lads between, let's say, twenty and and twenty five. You know, it's a good group there, and mm -hmm. and I'm looking for those to keep improving all the time. They, you know made good strides last year. They all need to step up that 10 or 15% this year. They can. There's, there, you know, there's big improvement in them. We have, we feel, the right senior pros around to guide them. And and and, and um, at, at times, you know, in League Two, there's, there's, there's nothing like experience. It's almost like, you know, some game management wins you games, particularly yeah. in the winter time. And, you know, we, we, to, to, to get promoted, we, we know that we need that. But underneath them, we feel we've got, you know, we've got quite a good a good group of younger players that have got improvement in them as well, the need to keep improving. And so, you know, Connor at 24, 25, you know, I've, I've got high high hopes for. Delighted he's joined us. Johnny Williams, I think, is is a, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. I was, I wanted, you know, I was the one wanted to bring him in. Uh, uh, everybody agrees with me that he could be a match winner. Mm -hmm. I think John John's high is right up there in terms of as good as anybody in the league. And and you know him coming back to Kent, meeting his family, um, seeing, you know, uh, um, seeing him, looking at him as a person. He's somebody I, uh, you know, I've met before anyway. Both myself and Neil, we're really excited to be working with him. He's different to the players that we've got within the squad, and and as I said, you know, he's a he's a he's a he's a potential match winner, which I think we're going to need. You're looking at him last year. He got 11 goals in in League Two. He's you know I I call I call him what is League Two ready. You know he's not he's not going to be surprised by anything that no, happens and 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 looking at the type of player as I said, you know he's a, he's an exciting addition for us I think and uh, somebody that can win games. Yeah, where, just quickly, can I where where do you see Johnny's best position? Because I I listened to his interview that's just come out and I follow with with Phil um, from the media department and they asked him sort of what type of player he is and he says he likes to be central but he played a lot of time higher and wider for Swindon. Where do you potentially see? Neil, yourself, Hesse, Libs, yeah. everybody getting the best out of Johnny. Higher up and wide or, or maybe in a more central area? Can he play as an eight? Can he play as a ten? I, I think um, Neil likes to be flexible in the front positions. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's, you know, had quite a lot of success towards the end of the season with a back four mm -hmm. and, and, and that settled down. Uh, and he likes to be flexible with the, with the front positions. And I think that will suit John to get the best of him. You know, but but I, I, no, I don't think he's somebody that you know we 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 wouldn't put bring him into the squad or I wouldn't bring him into the squad and class him as a winger. I no. think he's a I think he's an attacking midfield player. I mm -hmm. think he's capable of goals. I do think sometimes I've seen him come you know play play down the left hand side with an overlapping fullback, and I've yeah. seen him very effective in that role as well because you know he can get inside into pockets pick the pick the ball up and with somebody running outside him he can drive very well so you know there's there's a variety of roles that he'll play in this year uh, I, I think he'll play right across the front line he's not he's not an out and out sent forward um uh, uh, but um sorry okay. sorry pal my back yeah that's it he's not an out and out sent forward but um in, in terms of you know, w w what he can do and what he can produce. I, I think the best way to describe Johnny is, it's not where he starts, it's where he finishes. Because, he's, you know, his movement is very, very good. And you, you, you need those fluent players, those flexible players, uh, to be able to break down defences. I shall look forward to seeing him action. Kenny, I appreciate your time as always. I think your battery might be on, the, uh, on its way out. Is that correct? So I'm going to let you go. Like I say, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it because I understand you've had a very long day. No um, Jules fans... As always, please keep liking, subscribing, doing everything that you do for the channel. Um, hope you've enjoyed listening to this as much as I've enjoyed listening to Kenny. I could sit here for hours and hours listening to Kenny talk football. Um, little, real life football manager, encyclopedia. Um, so thanks again to Kenny. Do not forget that these videos are in association with Art of Football. So check out the link to their website in the description. We'll be back soon for another video. But until next time, up the jewels. <laughs>